Section 3 The Petty Imperia, with the collapse of the Astronomicon and the fall of Terra, the Imperium, as previously noted, was shattered utterly. From M43 onwards, even the concept of a united human empire became nearly impossible, as local powers and selfish megalomaniacs took their moments to strike. No longer was there an Imperium, that monolithic concept had died in the fires of anarchy. From now on, there were merely hundreds of petty Imperia and kingdoms. Some were the size of sectors, others merely consisting of a single world or system. Some of these Imperia claimed authority from Terra, and tried to unify, others abandoned the Imperium declaring themselves avatars for him, or even trying to supplant him entirely. Some maintained the xenophobic stance of the old Imperium, while others grew lax or simply ignored the teachings of the church. Some, such as Ophelia, took their fervor too far. We must also remember that many, many Imperial worlds simply collapsed, as warp storms cut them off from essential supplies. This was particularly a problem for many hive worlds who simply starved to death within a couple of years, as their agri world severed links with them, through warp storms. Or through mad warlords stealing the supplies before they got there. It would take years to explain every Imperium created at this time, and every situation that they entail. However, I shall endeavor to depict the largest and most influential petty Imperia created along with monikers created to differentiate between them. In reality, each of the petty Imperia merely called themselves the Imperium as they refuse to admit the legitimacy of their rivals. 1. The Rogue Trader Imperium The most eastern of the Petty Imperia, the Imperium of Jahd Lusser is possibly the most changed of the Imperia. During the first few decades of utter chaos following the Astronomicon's collapse, the extremely successful Rogue Trader, Lusser, was forced to break warp in the system of Corin, along with his large, well-stocked and well-armed trading fleet. Lusser was a shrewd and learned man, and the death of all his astropaths told him that the Imperium was no more. He wasted no time with incredulity or shock, but instead set to work. He knew that, in order to protect his assets in the wake of the collapse, he needed to form a base of operations, and to acquire territory and property. Corin would have to do. He made planet fall on Corin II, a populous hive world and the capital of the system, and discussed various protection deals for the planet, entering negotiations with the Lord Governor's staff and government. His scribes and law scholars, using complex litigation and jargon, managed to swindle Lusser into the governmental process, insinuating him into the essential position of defense and culture chamberlain. Over the years, this road branched into other areas, like weapons manufacture and internal security, though he wisely kept the Adeptus Arbites on as enforcers. Though now their role expanded to overall system security, rather than just enforcing of imperial law, using his acquired wealth, and his vast resources, he bought the Southern Hive Spire for himself, and built himself a lavish apartment complex, with extensive grounds. His ambitions went further, however. When the elections for the next governor came around, two decades later, Lusser was there, patronizing a promising candidate for the role. The eventual governor picked was his man, and this gave him unprecedented power on the system. He integrated his fleet with the large fleets of monitors and system defense ships, before using them to secure other worlds in the system such as the Prison Moon, orbiting Corin V. Crucially, Lusser recognized the need for an effective fighting force, beyond the PDF, in order for him to secure territories beyond the Corin system. Corin was a roughly average system, except for the fact that, upon Corin II, a vast Adeptus Mechanicus storage facility was located upon the western continent. Using the corrupted local law, he used his powers to order the storage yard searched. What he found there would alter the course of the Rogue Trader Imperium's history notably. Thousands upon thousands of Corvus pattern suits of space marine power armor. He threatened to have the remaining tech priests upon the world destroyed, unless they adapted these suits for human soldiery. They, realizing they were cut off from the rest of their brethren, accepted these terms. Pragmatically, Lassa realized he couldn't make perfect human-sized power armor from the suits, so had them combined with elements of carapace armor, in order to mass-produce them better. However, he still needed bodies to fill. He did not want to deplete the PDF or their reserves, and refused to relinquish his own personal army for this task. Thus, he turned to the dregs of Corin the underhivers of the hive worlds, and the convicts imprisoned upon Corin V's cold moon. He persuaded many thousands to volunteer, offering pardons, free food, and the prospect of drugs and violence to these hard-bitten killers, in exchange for service. These brutes were trained by the very best soldiers on Corin, 
and even the one who starts upon Luss's staff, Sergeant Proctor of the White Scars. They were equipped with the cheapest, oldest bolters Lusser could scrounge up as they were the only one available. Even then, there weren't really enough, so many of the armored shock troops had to make do with heavy caliber auto guns instead. Worried about loyalty, Lusser devised a cunning strategy. He gave the soldiers lots of combat enhancing drugs and stimulants. This made them rather strong and fast, and had the added benefit of being rather addictive. These shock troops became dependent upon these drugs, and ensured their constant loyalty. Lhasa, ever the rogue, presumptuously called them space marines. Within a few hundred years, the Corrin system Imperium faced a major problem. The reserves of food were running dangerously low, after so many years cut off from any trade with the local agri-world. Fortunately, the warp storms had somewhat cleared by this point, and Lhasa took this opportunity with both hands. He ordered his fleets to the agri-world as swiftly as they could. Led by Locker, he also dispatched his space marines as well, using a series of short warp jumps. The fleet only took a couple of months to reach the agri-world which normally only took a week to travel to before the collapse of the Emperor's guiding light. Eventually, they made it to the agri-world. Initially the world refused to submit to the Imperium, and so Locker led the space marines into battle. The sacking of the world took only a couple of weeks. The borderline psychotic and lethally efficient space marines utterly bested the sparse and inexperienced PDF defenders. The planet was subdued, and trade resumed with Corrin within the year. This was to be the first action amongst many that the space marines of Corrin would undertake. Over the next few decades, the petty Imperium swelled to over 25 worlds. With this, the size of the space marine force expanded too, along with the auxiliary, non-power armored army that soon sprang up in their wake, which was used to garrison captured worlds. This empire under Lhasa was a profoundly poor one, but was nevertheless ingenious. Any scraps of technology, no matter how bizarre and incomplete, were used by Lhasa's captured adepts, and made into things that could almost be called useful. Remote controlled bombs, converted land speed of chassis, poor quality programmable robots, and various other bizarre pieces of technology. Everything found a use. He was also open in his recruitment, allowing mutants and scum into his imperial army, each with their own regiments. Thus, a rogue became a ruler, and rebuilt his own little imperium into something resembling civilization. Here's the rest of this background pulled from my old computer, so it hasn't been proofread or anything. Apologies for any grammatical errors. To the Aphelian Imperio, in those dark, chaotic early days of the Cataclysm, when the Emperor finally died, it seemed as though the center of the Imperial Church was ripped out forever, and stamped into the dust. However, the Ekelsioc managed to flee terror, even as the demons began to pour from the Imperial Palace like a vile fanged tide. Though the majority of his fleet were either destroyed in the escape, or were dragged into insanity during the insanely turbulent warp transit, the head of the Ministorum survived, and ascended upon Aphelia, the second most holy site in the whole Imperium. War and anarchy tore across the Imperium, and he quickly realized the Imperium needed a rallying point. Thus, the Ekelshiark, Pius Julia, gathered together all the astropaths that had not been consumed by the sudden loss of their anchor point in the warp, and ordered them to send out a message. This message was a summons to the Adeptus Auroritus, ordering all of them, no matter where they were, to return to their spiritual center. Over the next decade, the Orders made their way back to Aphelia, fighting through the consuming madness and chaos, to get back to their home. Over half of the Sisters of Battle, the Militant Orders, had died in the terrible wars against the New Devourer, and less than half of these survivors, made it back to Aphelia. Most either died in transit, got stranded on isolated worlds, or were otherwise slain by the ravenous monsters that crawled from the depths of madness. The fall of the Imperium emboldening these terrors enough to act, yet, still, the sisters came, and Ophelia was secured. Xenos and demonic forces were driven from the surrounding worlds within short transits to Ophelia, and an Imperium of roughly 30 worlds was brought under the direct rule of the Ministorum in exile. Pius soon declared that his Imperium was the one true Imperium, and only his Imperium truly followed the dictates of the Emperor. He refused to acknowledge the Emperor's death, and merely reformed his Imperium's laws, making them fulfill the rules of the Church much more closely. His Imperium became a theocracy far more strict and powerful than any Imperium before it. Broken naval fleets who survived their warp transits flocked to this new Imperium, and with them came a reasonable amount of Imperial Guardsmen who were quick to convert to the Aphelian Imperium's new, more pious doctrines. 
pathetically grateful to their saviors, the humans upon these worlds swiftly reconverted to the imperial church. Fanatics clogged the streets of every world, flagellants, doomsayers, and receptionists filling the air with the fevered sounds of desperate prayers to their dead god. Ophelia itself, the vast world-spanning cathedral, was filled with gibbering and despairing pilgrims and desperate civilians. They all demanded to understand why their god had forsaken them. How could the emperor lose? Was not humanity the dominant force in the universe? Many ascensionist cults arose on the Aphelian world, they held the view that the emperor had not died, but had instead ascended to full godhood. The fall of the Imperium was his divine judgment upon man. Pius Julia, who had been steadily growing more and more unhinged, latched upon this idea. Canina Superior Kiralicus, one of the Ecclesiarch's new ruling body, the Council of Three, recommended caution. Unfortunately, the final member of the Council of Three was Inquisitor Lord Karamazov, the infamous Pyrophant of Salem Proctor. He agreed with the Ascensionists and the Ecclesiarch, and so the new reforms were passed. The Emperor, hence, had ascended, and he was punishing the decadent Imperio. This was the official view now. The only way to save their souls now, Karamazov declared, was sacrifice, and the punishment of the obvious heretics within their society. Mankind was lax and monstrous, and he had the cure fire. Across the Imperium, Poyas sisters, and Karamazov's baying mobs of recently converted fraternist militia, invaded their own worlds, denouncing millions as heretics. Before either beating them to death with rods and flails, or dragging them away on the witch ships of the Aphelian Imperium, night and day, Aphelia glowed with a baleful orange light, which played across the towering domes and noble, baroque spires of the holy world. As the furnaces beneath the giant cathedral blazed near constantly, as thousands of heretics were shipped in, only to be herded into the cleansing flames one by one, priests stood on great lecterns either side of the horrific furnaces, babbling some insane rhetoric from the various holy books that Ophelia had hoarded over the millennia. Karamazov personally executed a thousand heretics, his throne of judgment in near constant views. The people of Ophelia, however, did not resist these insane zealots. In fact, many of the most insane ascensionists threw themselves into the fires, crying hymnals as their bodies blistered and burned to ash. For 20 years, this reign of murderous terror continued. It was said that the process only stopped when a young girl, barely 6 Terran years old, ran to the Ecclesiarch, evading guards, and kissed his feet, in religious adoration. Before he could respond, the girl was shot by a wild-eyed fratterist militiaman. In a terrible rage, Pius ordered the man's innards boiled, and he was taken away to be executed. The genocide stopped soon after that day, as Pius realized his orders had destroyed even the faithful. He had come to this realization despairingly late, and the Aphelian Imperium was left severely weak following this period of witch hunts. Almost a third of the population was killed, and the Imperium's industry was terribly understaffed by then. After another 20 years, the Imperium was still struggling, and it took the Talon War to open the new Ecclesiarch Honestorian's eyes to this conspicuous lack of resources. It was in 234 M45, that the Aphelian Imperium first came into conflict with the Talon Empire. The Talons were located just to the galactic east of the Aphelians. The Talons had been a tiny empire under the rule of the original Imperium and their greatest contribution to it had been merely desert specialist imperial guard regiments. With the loss of the Imperium, Talon had survived surprisingly well, having already a small empire with its own resources. The lack of an imperial tithe for soldiers had allowed them to expand their PDF force far beyond what was once capable. In fact, so much did it expand, that they inevitably developed an active offensive force, and managed to maintain a fleet of starships. Using captured at mech expertise and an abundance of natural resources on one of their periphery colonies, which soon became one giant shipyard. The Talon believed strongly in the Emperor, but their views were far more traditionalist than Ophelia's radical reforms. Thus, when Talon expanded westwards, and encountered Ophelian worlds, they offered these worlds an alternative to Ophelian insanity. Many civilians on these outlying worlds, disgruntled with the massive death toll of the Aphelian regime, openly pleaded to the Talon to save them or so the Talon Empire claimed. Thus, when the Sororitas came to put down these revolts, the Talon fleets were there to engage them. And so, the war began. The Talon vessels were of poor quality, and most of their conscript armies were nowhere near as effective as the highly disciplined Adeptus Sororitas. However, the Sororitas had incredibly weak supply lines, and their resources were woefully depleted. 
It was said at the Battle of Kalanay, the sisters fought without bolters, for their supplies of bolter shells were so low. In contrast, the Talans had a well-developed, and above all, extensive logistic train, with numerous way stations supplying their vessels between each short warp jump. Their ships were cheap and terrible, but numerous, and they overwhelmed the sisters of battle. The Aphelians lost 16 worlds in the war, and were driven back from their former territory. All because of their depleted resources. Thus, Honestorian instigated his heathen levy reforms. These new Echelshiagel bulls tasked the large witch ship fleets to change their tactics. They were to spread out from Aphelian space, and find heathen worlds. The populations of these worlds, due to their heresies, were to be subjugated. However, they would not be offered conversion as a way out. Instead, all non-Aphelian imperial cultists, be they Thorians, Hemavores, machine cultists or anyone else, were to be set to work as slaves and serfs. They would work the fields of the surviving Aphelian agri-worlds, and they were put to work in the industrial worlds that the Echelshiok permitted to be built on worlds within the Empire. The Emperor, Honestorian was quoted as saying, desires the Imperium be rebuilt in his divine image. He destroyed the old realm, so shall we rebuild it to his exaltations. Our penance has been paid now in blood and ash. Now, the time of reformation is at hand. Thus began the second phase of the Aphelian Imperium. In many ways, this phase of the Aphelian Imperium was even more terrible than the initial phase. However, that is a story for a later date. 3 The Delphine Imperium Lord Inquisitor Delphine was a very powerful inquisitor, and was leading a vast conglomeration of imperial forces, in the cleansing of the Carpathis system, when the Astronomicon finally collapsed. Many thousands of his fleet's vessels were lost in the warp, and the rest were spat out somewhere within the Ultima Segmentum. Delphine's astropaths and navigators all died, save for one, named Orechi. Using her talents, Delphine discovered several nearby systems, and he persuaded the fleet admiral to make a series of short warp jumps to reach these nearby worlds. Within six months, they had made it to these systems. The Inquisitor dispensed with pleasantries, and instantly seized the governor's palace of the capital world, Harkon. When he discovered that Harkon and its fellow in-system worlds, had all suffered losses of astropaths, and widespread riots in the streets, he knew something very wrong had happened. This realization became more and more evident as M43 continued onwards. For 13 years, the Inquisitor and his crusade forces desperately fought off constant pirate attacks and Xenos incursions. That seemed to be a near constant occurrence across the entire subsector. As they fought, they unconsciously began to utilize Harkon and its systems more and more. Reserves for lost guardsmen came from within Harkinian PDF ranks. Munitions and supplies were gifted by the governors and provincial lords of Harkon and the outlying worlds and adjacent systems. The Harkon system was always in an unofficial league of governors, even before the death of the emperor. Whereas before, the Inquisitor would have probably destroyed the League due to the potential for subversive behavior inherent to their League, he now openly encouraged it. The close ties between worlds was utilized to its fullest by the cunning Inquisitor. Using his crusade force of Red Hunters Marines, Death Watch, and vast regiments of Inquisitorial Stormtroopers and Imperial Guardsmen, Delphine kept the League of Planetary Governors or LPG relatively intact. However, it became clear that there was no one else coming to relieve the Inquisitor and his forces. The Emperor was dead, and so was his Imperial. Yet, this was not a particularly terrible problem for the pragmatic Delphine. Over years of fighting, the infrastructure of his crusade, and that of the governments of the LPG, had merged significantly. His crusade was divided, fighting on all fronts across the LPG's borders, and many of his generals had agreed to defense contracts with local power magnates and lords. Offering protection in exchange for supplies and limited leadership of the aforementioned provinces. Delphine himself became famous, and many called him the Breaker, due to a legendary battle on the borders, where the Inquisitor used his thunder hammer to smash the gates of a rebellious city open, allowing his troops to enter the city and slaughter the enemy. When the old governor of Harkon died, it was with popular support that Delphian, flanked by his Red Hunter Astart's bodyguards, entered the central city, and seized the leadership officially. Though the LPG technically was a council of equals, the Harkon seat was always the most powerful. With Delphine on the throne, it became clear that this was no longer a mere alliance. It was an empire. Delphine, intoxicated by his success in crafting a functioning state from the ashes of a shattered Imperium, declared that this was the new Imperium, the sole legitimate power in the universe. 
and, in a bold move, he declared himself Holy King, chosen of the Emperor. While the more primitive worlds of his 50 world imperium could readily accept this, the more urban hive worlds and agri worlds became uneasy. During this period, there were hundreds of rebellions. Each was easily crushed by the feudal military of Delphine. The largest of these rebellions was led by Orochi, who was declared Oracle of the Future, and denounced Delphine as apostate and anti-emperor. Crucially, she gained the support of a number of lords on the outskirts, who rallied around her. A large naval engagement over the world of Fancid decided this rebellion, and Orochi was killed during the battle. Unified once more, the Delphine Imperium seemed set to maintain itself as a sated power. However, in 444 M45, the now ancient Delphine finally died. The vassal governors each claimed they should take his place, while the Red Hunters backed Delphine's son, Aber Delphine, as next in line. Unwilling to challenge the dread of starts, the governors acceded without incident. Aber was young and impetuous. Deluded by the distorted tales of the past Imperium told to him by his father, Abar declared that they must expand into the galaxy, and re-establish the Imperium. However, he did not take into account the fact most worlds were still recovering from almost a century of civil war. The belligerent king ordered expeditions into neighboring systems. However, these occupations could never work, as he hadn't the resources for such actions. In the end, these turned into raids and wars of plunder, where greedy former crusade generals, power magnates and local lords who, increasingly, became indistinguishable from each other. So similar in power and prestige the three strata war would make planet fall on various human and xenos worlds, smash their cities and slaughter hundreds of thousands of people in random, brutal slaughter, rape women and men, burn down perceived heathen churches, and steal all things considered valuable. Aba Delphine allowed this practice, however, as it provided a ready stream of income into his imperio. However, it soon drew the attention of other powerful forces, who soon descended upon this imperio. This imperio, which considered itself so very mighty, but who would soon be proven entirely wrong. Section 04 Angels unleashed the Space Marine Free Company Sadid. The fall of the imperio, while not instantaneous, was brutal and swift. The Astronomicon was hacked into pieces, spluttering and dying. Whole fleets and worlds lost contact with one another. This one action may not have caused the collapse of the Imperium, but compounded by the sudden upsurge of warp storms and uprisings, it certainly hastened it. Just as the Imperium fragmented, so too did each and every Space Marine chapter. At a stroke, all Marines on campaign across the Imperium immediately lost contact with their Segmentum commands and Chapter Fortresses. 10,000 years worth of warp charts became obsolete in a single heartbeat. A few chapters had the good fortune to see most of their marines in one system, or a few of their navigators survive. These chapters managed to gather their forces together in numbers almost comparable to those before the cataclysm. However, these lucky few shall be covered in a later section. The majority of chapters were shattered into their constituent parts, be they companies or mere squads. These companies became known as the Orphan Companies, and spent their time desperately searching the void for their lost brothers rather than campaigning. They stumbled through the galaxy near blindly, their navigators and astropaths all either dead or maimed. Many Orphan squads were picked off by opportunistic pirates, or rogue empires eager for a quick dose of vengeance against the fallen Imperio. However, the grit and fighting prowess of a space marine is not so easily overcome. Even with the loss of so much, some larger companies managed to survive and even thrive in the vacuum left by the Imperium's collapse. Most of these space marine companies marched on undaunted by the prospect of a universe without him. This may seem strange, but a quote from Brother Berber the Eagle Bleed, one of the leaders of one such space marine force, may go some way to explaining this mindset. You ask me what I fight for? Not him. Not anymore. The great monolith of Imperial authority perchance? Nay, I say again nay. We fight for a question. You may scoff, but our question is one which drives us on, beyond sense, or reason, when hope and fear are dead. The question which drives us is thus what else do we have? What else? Having no desire to retire or serve a new master, and no marketable skills beyond the blade and gun, these marines found purpose by simply continuing to do what they had been created for. Whatever their justifications, these self-styled free companies needed supplies and equipment if they were to continue their long wars. These companies rented their services to whomsoever would supply them with bolts, repairs to armor, and the vast quantities of calories needed for a start's physiology. 
These estates for hire were employed against rival imperiums, Xeno's incursions, and demonic-led uprisings. They only stipulated that the client must be a true human. Mutant-led imperiums, such as the Vileborn Imperium, were repeatedly shunned by all but the most unscrupulous of free companies. Other, less reputable free companies merely raided human colonies, taking what they needed and burning the rest. What right did these mortals have to deny their betters? Why should the strong protect these weaklings? Surely punishment was all they deserved. Such was the reasoning of these honorless renegade starts. The free companies which formed from fragments of the marines malevolent were particularly infamous for atrocities. By M46, many free companies savagery made them indistinguishable from the chaotic renegades of legions such as the night lords or dark tuskers. Only the raven guards fragments, who were used to fighting in smaller groups, maintained their dignity and honor through this dark time. They continued to answer desperate pleas for help, and they stole only from their enemies, refusing to assault human empires. Yet, they were only one chapter amongst many thousands. The other free companies spent the next millennia gleefully plaguing the divided and panic-stricken galaxy. The Adeptus Astartes know no fear. Now they would know no mercy either well. So much for the chaplains, the adamantine worlds the Adeptus Mechanicus, the Awakening, and the War of Tus Firesidit. The Adeptus Mechanicus, and like all other branches of the ruined Imperium, did not collapse with the loss of the Astronomicon. Their end came from a far more shameful reason. The machine cult had always been distinct from the rest of the Imperial society. Always there have been Ministorum clerics who frown on calling the Emperor Omnisha, and Magi who chafe at the idea of some unaugmented Terran claiming lordship over their church. As a result of this friction, the Forge Worlds had always operated more independently than the average Imperial world. Forge Worlds communicated through the Mechanicus Esoteric Manifold system rather than standard astrotelepathy, further widening the cultural divide. During the collapse of the Imperium, the Mechanicus continued on much as they did before, albeit with less active personnel since they could no longer receive food shipments from Agri Worlds to feed all their adepts. Physical contact between Forge Worlds and outlying research stations was also mostly extinguished, as the Explorator fleets had not yet invented a replacement for navigators. Yet, the Mechanicus could not capitalize upon this advantageous position. Each individual Forge World possessed massive strategic resources, but these were too valuable to be risked in the dangers of warp travel, and so meant nothing at the galactic level. Seeing this weakness, the more opportunistic petty Imperiums began using their superior numbers to raid the starving Forge Worlds. Those tech priests stationed on non-Mechanicus worlds and starships were indentured by their employers. These isolated machine cultists were forced to declare oaths of servitude to their new masters. Inquisitor Delphine's Imperium greatly benefited from this practice, filling his arsenals with many terrible weapons. The petty Imperiums not to mention the countless pirate bands and demon-worshipping cults. Realized they desperately required Mechanicus expertise in order to maintain the technology looted from the late Imperium. Trafficking in tech priests quickly became a very lucrative trade. Mechanicum vessels were ambushed when they burst back into the Materium after perilous warp transits, their undersupplied crews no match for the highly motivated raiders. Forge worlds were besieged in some extreme cases, often assaulted by brief alliances of several petty Imperiums. These alliances would quickly crumble once their leaders began to squabble over who would get the largest shares of the human and technological plunder. To combat this, the Forge Worlds were forced to pour their dwindling resources into their military forces. Each Skiterii army would have to defend its own Forge World, without any hope of off-world support. Thus, they had to expand into nearby resource worlds. Forge Worlds lucky enough to have some Agri Worlds or mining colonies nearby lost no time in subjugating these precious areas, setting up vast defense stations around these worlds. It was said any world without a dense forest of gun platforms and space stations was doomed. Agri worlds controlled by a forge world became known as bullet farms, as every plantation had a battalion of Skaterii stationed in it. Most forge worlds followed this policy, but others followed different doctrines of the cult Mechanicus. Some forges were heavily influenced by the dreaded innovator cults, and contemplated the worst heresy possible developing new technology and armaments. The forge world of Grimana was the main forge to actually put this policy into practice. The dead ruins of Grimana still howl with the mechanical cries of orphaned monsters, and technologies that shouldn't be trifled with. Some Forge Worlds, like Dread Quarter, became even more isolationist than before, sealing their worlds from the outside universe. 
the Magi of Kalta sent out their few remaining naval vessels to every world within reach. Those not already left barren by the new devourer, were made so by multiple virus barrages, before the ash fields left in the exterminatus wake were then laced with toxic chemicals, which prevented any terraforming to ever take place again. Thus, surrounded by a network of dead worlds, these forges sealed shut, and many of the highest magi retreated deep under the surface. To survive, the workforce was slowed, over the course of a thousand years, rendered down into fleshy substances, remade as servitors, or fed to the few remaining magi, via feeding tubes and osmosis chambers. These worlds became underground, twisted metal hellscapes, filled with cybernetic zombies, and ruled by ravenous, cannibalistic tech priests, who were now virtually nothing more than spidery, cloaked machines covered in twisted structures, which barely kept their wasted rotten flesh from dying. Of course, some forge worlds were subverted by a previously weak cult, following their respective periods of isolation, the cult of the dragon. These forge worlds seemed to churn out technology far above their skills, and this technology diffused into every strata of the hierarchy. Serfs and slave workers began using the sophisticated cutting tools brought to them, the thick green beams far in advance of anything previously seen. Mid-range tech adepts began to utilize strange technologies, apparently from the Dark Age, which could teleport them around the forges safely, without fear of demonic attack. For the teleportation devices did not send them through the warp. Even the highest level, the fabricator and his major, would begin to use sophisticated semi-solid metal alloys, which apparently resisted the aging process entirely. Of course, day by day, inch by inch, the forge world was subverted. When the great silver vessels came for them, and they moved to attack these forces, they found their weapons useless, as their technology itself rebelled against their masters. Their odd green energy weapons failed to fire, teleporters teleported unfortunates inside ferrocrete walls, or simply into the void. The great silver fleets arrived, and enslaved the worlds within hours, as the tiny dragon cults on the worlds struck deals with their silver overlords. These world's central forge complexes were stripped down and converted, becoming great glowing green gates, which pulsed with violent life. The populations of these worlds were herded into the vast gates, where they were stripped down into their component atoms, and pulsed away somewhere. Those cultists who loyally stood by and watched, as their brethren were destroyed, were rewarded the gift of immortality. Their bodies were painfully broken, and metallic additions were grafted into their still living bodies. Their minds were scoured. Those who showed signs of blankness were remade as tall, strong-limbed pariah machines, while the others were simply stripped of all conscious thought, and were grafted into the workings of the machines themselves, by the mechanical spiders which roamed across these cold metallic forge worlds. Across the collapsing galaxy, hundreds of forge worlds fell this way, the souls of their populace fed into the central core of a vast web of ethereal horror. All channeled into the world whose name lived in infamy for countless millennia to come Mars. Mars was near the center of the Emperor's fall. The tech priests were driven utterly insane by this sudden realization that their omniscia was no more. Some tried vainly to claim he had merely turned into naught but information, the machine god made pure. But their voices were drowned out by the increasingly insane ramblings of the divided rival cults across the planet, fanning the flames of this madness with the nauseating waves of warp psychosis, rippling through the void, and driving their souls to madness. The cult of the dragon grew marginally in numbers, but mostly retreated to the Noctis Labyrinth, where the taint of the warp was extinguished by powerful, mysterious wards. Here, they awaited the awakening of their true master, the true machine god incarnate in their opinion of course, the Void Dragon. During the 41st millennium, five of the dragon's silver vessels managed to land upon Mars, depositing an item of extreme importance to the star god's dread plans. The item was a vast, monolithic block of metal. It writhed with unseen power, and seemed to exist in a rectangular shape through a choice, rather than through physical necessity. It was the dragon's necrodermis, his metal flesh. However, it was not until the fall of the emperor, that the void dragon's essence was finally free from its binding. Unlike the other star gods, it did not burst forth then and attack. It was not rash and foolish, like the Nightbringer. Once it did arise, however, it was almost as powerful as it had been before it had ever been struck by the talisman of all. With cold fury, the void dragon conquered Mars, easily batting aside the sporadic, gibbering armies of the Martians. The vaults were plundered. All the lethal, forbidden technologies, were fixed and perfected, and those weapons kept only due to stupid ignorance, were discarded. 
The solar system, at this moment, was not equipped to face the dragon's sudden onslaught, and world after world fell, and every fleet was combated and defeated. Only Titan held out against the Stur God, but we shall discuss the valiant and stubborn defense of Titan, by the Custodes in Exile and the Grey Knights, at a later stage. Thus, with the solar system secured, the Void Dragon turned its ancient gaze outwards, coveting the realm of life and sentience, denied him for so long. Fortunately for the galaxy, an unlikely savior intervened in that same year. Screaming across the void, streaming for the eye like a vile spew of vomit and pus, Abaddon the Despoiler, the dark leader of the Western Chaos Imperium, was expanding beyond his already extensive borders. With his legions of monstrous astarts, his countless billions of the despoiled, his fallen Cadian army, backed up by countless demonic engines and vile, semi-living demonic vessels, and renegade formerly Imperial fleets, the Chaos Lord promised that he would finally seize the solar system, and make his ultimate victory complete. As it transpired, he was beaten to it by the Great Etan. The War of the Two Spheres began in earnest, when his initial vanguard fleet surged forth from the warp, and were instantly engaged and destroyed by vast, silver ships, shimmering with arcane power. The Despoiler, in his fury, deployed more and more vessels, hoping to engage and destroy these interlopers he would not be denied his prize. The Necron vessels of the dragon, however, were far too powerful and, above all, maneuverable. Only the most corrupt and demonic vessels could effectively hold off the Necron ships. Slowly, it seemed as though the forces of the dragon ascendant, would push back a baton, and perhaps even begin counter-invasion. The battles fought in the war could fill a library themselves, such was the dark legends birthed from that cataclysmic war from the lead melting hull of Venus, where specially designed molten Necron constructs battled hellfire demons, and Astartes and mortal vaporize in the heat. To the unforgivably cold expanses of Europa, where mighty Necron tainted titans, and spidery metallic creatures from ancient myth, wrestled great tentacled Cinchian nightmares. And monsters dragged all below the icy crust, to their doom, all seemed to be turning against a baton. No matter the infernal fury of his constructs, legions of fanatics and demons, he could not match the dreadful majesty of the Void Dragon's forces. It was master of the Void, and everything in it. On the very surface of the sun, it strangled the life from a summoned Scarbron. It slew the entire army of Felshen Torben, a dread demon prince that was old when humanity was young. Abaddon grew desperate. Throughout the Oort Cloud, the hollow sphere region of comets which orbited Solar, the Despoiler dropped spawn. All the billions of spawn birthed by aborted ascensions were dumped on the frozen comets. Using vile sorcery, these spawn were filled with the dreadful obliterator virus, driving their bodies to expand and twist ever more than before. As billions of tons of machinery and weaponry were spewed forth from the chaotic monsters, fusing into horrific merge constructs barely resembling anything in reality should ever resemble. Through ruined lungs, and innumerable twisted vox mouths, Abaddon's dark mechanicus servants pumped scrap code and logic demons, distorting reality itself for light minutes in all directions. Even as the Void Dragon slaughtered the last of Abaddon's forces within the solar system, Abaddon and the majority of his forces outside the solar system, beyond the Oort Cloud, sealed the trap. The giant obliterator spawn were spewing forth anti-machine energies, straight from the warp, in a perfect sphere around the entire solar system. The Void Dragon tried to send his forces beyond the cloud, however, as soon as they tried to push their way through the cloud, their machines would fail, and self-destruct, lest chaos contaminate the Necron nodal net. The howl of the dragon at that moment, so the legend goes, reverberated throughout the galaxy. He had escaped one trap, only to be lured into another. Abaddon had sealed the dragon away in the solar system out of mere hate and spite, yet unbeknownst to him, he had possibly saved the entire galaxy. As it cast the awakening Necron forces from their master, and thus they returned to dormant mode across the galaxy, merely securing the local area around their tomb world, in preparation for the next call to arms. Of course, saving the galaxy is a relative term. For thousands of years after this period, things went from bad to worse for every inhabitant of the Milky Way. False gods rose, tyrants butchered millions, forge worlds became ever more violent and isolated, and humanity fragmented into ever more ignorant and brutish factions, as a new, far worse power arose in the hearts of the deluded. Also, the Necrons only had to wait a few thousand years, before they returned to their original destiny. For, as the galaxy at large would come to realize, the Void Dragon was only one Satan. 
If you haven't already check out my Redbubble portfolio, you might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services. It's time to stop!